Can I ask everyone to please take their seats? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and welcome to our public affairs program this evening. I'm sure you've all been here at the League House and having the opportunity to, uh, to see this phenomenal portrait. And tonight's a really special night to bring everybody together to learn more about the background and, and everything that's, uh, that's gone into making this, uh, making this possible for everyone to enjoy. Uh, my name is Mike Piotrowitz. I'm the vice chair of the Legacy Foundation here at the Union League our nonprofit charity. Our mission here at the foundation is to support the US Constitution and the free enterprise system and the history and the values that we all believe in here at the Union League. We accomplish this through informed, engaged programs like the one we're having tonight, lectures, scholarships that we provide, exhibits and collections that we have here at the league to just let everybody become more aware of what we're all about here at the league and really looking at the values in the con of the constitution and the free enterprise system that we all believe so strongly in. 
These programs are made possible because of the generosity of our league members who participate and support our foundation. And I'd like to at this time, just make a little, an introduction here of a, of a new member here that we have, not, actually not new anymore, probably well, six months now. Krista Moran, our Director of Development is, uh, is standing over here. We have, some, we have some big plans for the foundation to further, further our mission and what we're looking to accomplish and get the word out in, in our beliefs and, and what's so important to us. Kristen is leading our development efforts um, and, and, and really we thank all of you that support the foundation. If you have any interest in learning more about the foundation, you can talk with me, our chair, Joan Carter is here. Kristen, John Miko, Kira, please, um, please talk to us about what we're doing if, you're, if, you, if you wanna be more involved. Um, we're looking for more involvement from people, uh, more support, everything we can do to grow our mission and, and, and enhance what we're accomplishing here at the league. Our program tonight is, uh, is a super exciting one. It's about an hour program. We have uh, a Q and A time at the end, I think John, right? Uh, so we'll have some time for questions and answers. Um, those of you that are joining on Zoom, if anyone is, uh, is on Zoom tonight, you can submit uh, your uh, questions through the Q&A part of the, of the, of the Zoom app. Um, one of the very important uh, responsibilities of the Legacy Foundation is really the, the, stewardship, the stewardship and responsibility of our historic art collection. It's amazing what we have here. And we, we kind of, I think, tend to take it for granted sometimes we walk around, but it's always great to stop and look and, and just, I'm always amazed at what we, what we, have, what we have here. And it's a, it's a serious, serious um, undertaking uh, to, to really accept the responsibility and the sharing of, this, of, of our collections. Our collections committee is chaired by John Serlin. Um, John is a is an unbelievable asset to the foundation in this respect. He's very knowledgeable and, and a true expert. So instead of me making the introduction of our program tonight, the appropriate person to make this introduction is the chair of our collections committee, Mr. John Serlin. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Well, that mic, it was like a haircut or something. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight and thank Mike for that fine introduction. You know, I got this job because I was the only one that could say Mike Piotrowicz, Bob Sharufali, and John Aglialoro the first time without a mistake. So those are my real claims to fame here at the league. Um, you know, I'm very pleased to be here, but I just broke my glasses. So they're here in two pieces. They're not too much to start with, but you know, <laughs> who knows what I'm gonna say now? <laughs> you know, they, they gave me this, oh, what is this? Oh, I can see his bank records from this thing. This is great, thank you, uh, Mike uh, Piatrowitz, yes. Um, anyway, our job in the collections committee among others, is commissioning of new artworks. And I'm very pleased to say that in the past nine years, this committee has commissioned six uh, original artworks. These include the wonderful painting of the three medals of honor uh, on uh, this floor, down the, down the road a piece uh, by Don Traiani, which is a tribute to the U.S. Uh, colored troops that were raised by the Union League during the Civil War. Um, and I, being a Don Triani collector, particularly like that painting. Um, the 150th anniversary painting, Preservation of the Spirit, is also down on the floor below us and occupies a huge amount of space and is quite interesting and attractive. And no, the woman in the painting is not Joan Carter. Uh, <laughs> we have three bronze statues of George Boker, Ronald Reagan, and Donald Ross. Um, all of these commissions tell part of our story and help to advance our mission. The Douglas portrait is our sixth entry in this. 
Um, we began a, a search for a historic painting to put here in the historic Union League. And we were shocked to find, uh, I'm stopped reading, I'm sorry. Um, we, we were shocked to find that there are no portraits of Frederick Douglass. Although Frederick Douglass was the most photographed person of the 19th century. He had 160 photographs, which most people with a cell phone could take tonight. Um, but they were quite impressive um, photographs because he sort of looked the same in every one because he used them as propaganda to say that you people who do not take black people seriously have to look at us and realize that we're real serious people with gravitas. And you look at his portraits and this portrait, and this is a person of great gravitas. So he achieved a lot, but he also looked like he achieved a lot. Well, when we couldn't find one, um, well, this is free enterprise, you know, we went out and commissioned one. And with the help of our fantastic staff, um, which includes John Miko, uh, Jim Mundy, Kira foley Tusman, um, Amanda, uh, Joe Yanni, Keely Tulio, we were presented with ultimately 30 artists for us to go through and consider. We then formed a, sub, a small subcommittee and give Tim Hughes credit, who's sitting back there, uh, for being on our small subcommittee. And we selected an artist whose work we thought was wonderful. Well, it turned out that the artist that we selected was really just as wonderful and just as fascinating as the work that he produced. And he's made something that is a great addition to our collection. And he has been a great addition to our programs. And this is his third appearance. And each one is better than the last and people are paying more every time to get into these booths. So uh, I wanna thank all of you who supported this project and other projects with our financial support. Um, tonight, we will hear from uh, Jordan about the process of creating this portrait and his work generally. And interviewing Jordan um, is our executive director of the Legacy Foundation, Mr. John Miko. Please welcome Jordan and John. Thank you. Thank you, John. Can you hear me? You on? Yes, everybody can hear great, me okay? Great, great. Th thank you, Mike. Thank you, John. Um, and welcome, everyone. I'm really excited to just, just to spend more time with Jordan because, as, as John said, it's a wonderful addition, the art, but the artist is also a wonderful addition to the, to the League family. So thank welcome you. back. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you all for coming tonight. It's a pleasure to be here. So I, I'm... <laughs> So we talked a little bit just right before the, the program, and I'm going to start you off with a, a little kind of easy question in a sense. Um, you get this call from Jim Mundy, and he says, so the Union League Legacy Foundation wants to commission a portrait of Frederick Douglass, and we want you to do it. And you say, who's Jim Mundy? <laughs> <laughs> And your second question is... What's the union league? <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about... And, and just a little bit of uh, background. Uh, Jordan, uh, we have a, a list, and, and the list includes people who do commission portraits. And Jordan's not one of them. Uh, so this is not a typical phone call, right? That's right. Yeah. So yeah. What, what were you thinking at, at this point? Um, this was sort of at the, towards the, the height of the COVID lockdown. So this is, uh, so I, I hear from him at a time when um, I've been locked in the house with my wife and four-year-old son for uh, nearly a year. And, uh, and then suddenly somebody from the outside reaches in and um, has this great, uh, this great offer. Um, no, we, I, it was, I was caught completely by surprise, but at the same time, um, I, I was sort of just coming off of having done a portrait of Alan Turing for Princeton. Um, and so uh, having then hear from John, Jim Mundy about um, uh, commissioning a portrait of Frederick Douglass was, uh, again, just sort of a, a dream commission, you know, a, a sort of dream, a dream painting. 
So let, I know you've prepared a few slides to talk about the process yeah. of, of creating this particular uh, painting. So why don't, why don't you give us a little bit of, of the, sure. the storyline in terms of the creation of- Sure, of yeah. Chicago. I'd be curious how, how you guys got my name. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Um, well, I, I actually, <laughs> I mentioned that, uh, well, John mentioned, we had about 30 names that we went through. They came from the collections committee itself and Jim. Um, uh, Jim has a kind of a running list of, of, uh, of artists that we use for presidential portraits, uh, that is uh, Union League presidential portraits. Um, it included many of those. Um, by the way, that's a different process as you can imagine, so that's not included in John's uh, list. Um, but also collections committee members submitted uh, uh, a, a lot of different um, artists and we looked at them uh, online. Most of them were blind. We didn't know who the artists were. We were just looking at the art. And then a small subcommittee was put together and um, a lot of, and this is probably not known to most people, but if you do a portrait commissioning, a lot of uh, artists will have a list and it's a price list and it's, you know, for a face, it cost X. For a face and shoulders, it cost X plus this. And then for full length, it's this and that. And, and we're pretty used to that kind of standard stuff. And, and Jordan doesn't have any of that. Um, he just has some really great art. Um, so I think we were not sure you'd say yes. Um, and so why'd you say yes? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I would never be able to turn something like this down. But that does explain a little bit uh, one of Jim's first emails, which was, what would you charge for a head? What would you charge for mm -hmm. shoulders? What would you charge for that? Like, oh. Yeah, good question. Yeah. <laughs> and then we negotiated. Yeah. Right. <laughs> no, it was honestly, it was a dream sort of commission. Um, uh, yeah, Frederick Douglass was obviously somebody that I've read even from, from high school and um, just sort of a personal hero. So. Um, just an incredible opportunity for me. I, I would never turn it down. Yeah. Well, why don't you kind of run through a little sure. bit of the process, if you could? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll I'll take you a little bit quickly through the process from um, uh, how, essentially how I start the painting um, to how it ends up. Um, so one of the first things that we needed to decide was what photograph we would use, what reference we would use of Douglas. Um, as was said, there was a lot of photographs of Douglas. So how do we narrow that down? Um, one of the things that was important specifically for the, for the league was um, that we represent him at an age that he would have been when he spoke at the league. Um, so that, that sort of narrows down the timeline quite a bit. This particular photograph is from 1863. So he would have been 45 years old here. Um, and that, that would have been the time period and the age that he would have been when he, when he spoke for the league. Um, and so we, there was also, all, all of his photographs, he looks sort of stunning in ways. He's um, sort of a very powerful presence. But this particular photo we felt like represented him in a very dignified way and sort of gave the kind of feeling that um, the committee wanted the portrait to, to have. Um, and so once we decided on that, the next step was for me to produce a little study of it, um, a little compositional study and you can see we sort of cropped it, um, sort of close in on the head. And um, uh, the committee members were, were pleased with it, but then they, they sort of felt like, um, and maybe in order to capture the, the full presence of him, it might be nice to sort of zoom out a little bit, get a little bit more of his arms in there um, and his arms sort of resting on the table. Uh, and so the next step then was- Let to, me interrupt for a moment. Yeah. So you've got a black and white photograph and you have a color painting. Yes. How do you figure that out? That's a very um, interesting challenge. So <laughs> one of the things, so the, the, um, when, whenever you do a portrait of somebody that is no longer alive, it's called a posthumous portrait. Um, so as I said earlier, I had done a portrait of Alan Turing for Princeton University just before I um, had done this one. And that was the first time that I had done a posthumous portrait. And I was sort of confronted with this challenge of how do you take this black and white photo of somebody that it's an, it's an old photo and somebody that's no longer alive and make a color portrait of them. And not only in color, but give, them, give it the sense that, that there's a real living presence within the painting. Um, and so I'm, as a painter, I'm 
normally used to working from, from life, from live models. I don't generally work from photographs. Um, and so to work from a photograph already is a little bit of a challenge for me. So I thought, uh, why don't I use the photograph to understand the structure of the, of the head and get the likeness, but then find a model that resembles in some ways the, the subject and have that model pose so I can use that model for reference for complexion, um, sort of the subtleties in the color of the skin and, in, and also understanding the structure and the form. Um, and so I, that's, that's what I did for this painting as well. Uh, I used the photograph just to understand the, the, the structure of the head, get the likeness, but then I had a model as well posing for the, for the painting. And so um, the first step in the process, once I've got the canvas stretched, so that, that canvas is this canvas on my easel in my studio. I transfer the, the drawing to the canvas. Um, and it's an interesting process as well. You know, when I transfer it, I want to make sure that the composition is exactly right. So it, it's time consuming to, to transfer it. I transferred it about four different times. Um, because each time I felt like, oh, it's a, maybe a millimeter a little bit to the left or a millimeter to the right, it wasn't quite right. And I would just erase it all down. This is with charcoal, erase the whole thing down and retransfer it until I got to a composition that I liked, um, or at least that I felt kind of harmonized within the, the parameters of the canvas. Then the next step is to, to sort of lay in the initial colors. Um, and this is, again, this is in my studio. You can kind of see, um, there's a laser pointer on this one. You can see right there. That's actually a, a period jacket. So that's a jacket from the 19th century that um, very closely resembles the jacket that he was wearing. And I, I had it on a mannequin in the studio and I used that as a reference. Um, and then you can also see sort of down below here, I, I have that little study that I did and I keep that to the side as a reference for myself all the time. Um, this, is, this is just a first pass on the painting. It goes through many different passes. This is a second, well, second or third pass. My paintings require a lot of layering. I find that in order to get a sense, a real sense of flesh and the transparency of flesh, it's almost like weaving colors together. So one of the things that was also interesting, a sort of interesting challenge was the photograph that I used. So that's, this is the photograph that I used. Because it was taken at a distance, you know, in the photograph, you see his whole, his whole body. So when you zoom in on the head, the resolution is, is not, it's not super high res. So, and also the, the lights are kind of blown out. So it's in, in the light areas, it's a little bit tricky to see what, the form of his head is doing. Um, and so fortunately he was photographed so much. So there's this other photograph of him when he was younger in a very similar position and a much higher resolution. And so I was able to use that photograph as well as a reference to really understand a little bit better what the structure and the form of his, of his face was doing. These two uh, images remind me uh, of a discussion we had as, as a committee not, it was actually before we decided to, to do this project, we were discussing other options for a possible subject. And I think it was Tim Hughes who said, well, but he just looks so cool. We, we should do it because he just looks so cool. <laughs> and I think... The one on the left, I don't remember what year it was. It's obviously quite a bit younger. I don't remember exactly what, what year it was. It probably was in the late 40s. I'm not sure. I would guess. Sure either, yeah. The one on the right's from 63. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, uh, something else that I use a lot when I work is just other paintings as a reference. <clears throat> so these are uh, two, two different painters. These are both from the 19th century. Um, the one on the right is an academic study uh, by a German artist named Robert Stirl. And the one on the left is uh, a Spanish artist named um, Tapiro. Um, but just great examples, great references for me to use for flesh tone uh, as I paint. Um, this is a, just another image of the, of the painting and process in my studio. You can see I, um, at this point, I 
got the frame in, into the studio and it was just sort of sitting there waiting for the painting. Um, and this is, this is sort of later on in the process. You'll notice the background in the painting is quite a bit lighter than it is in, in this version. The background changed several times. Um, I originally did the same background that I had done in the study, in the small study. And I felt like when I got the frame and put it together, that the colors sort of clashed with the gold of the frame. So then I, was, I decided to try a few different backgrounds. This one, uh, we sort of collectively decided that it was a bit too light and that we would go a bit darker. Um, and so we did. This is my, that's my son and visiting me in the studio. <laughs> um, this, was, this was actually shortly after the model left. So where he's sitting is actually where the model would normally sit and pose for me. Tell us more about the model because I just learned this uh, yeah. about, about an hour ago. <laughs> so I had, um, I recently moved to Connecticut in February. Before that, I was living in Jersey City or New York City area. Um, when I was in New York City, I had lined up a great model um, to pose for it. He um, had a lot of features that really re resembled Frederick Douglass. Um, and then in, in the meantime of me getting everything prepared for the painting, I ended up moving to Connecticut. And so he, he wasn't able to commute as often as I, need, I, I needed him. Um, and so I needed to find another model. And um, so I ended up finding a model that, uh, that was a female. Um, it, wasn't a, <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't a guy. Um, but so she didn't have necessarily features that resembled. She didn't look like Frederick Douglass. She did not have a beard. She did not have a beard. Yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> However, um, she, her, the complexion of her skin was exactly what I was looking for. Um, she had the exact same color skin, this sort of golden, beautiful golden colored skin that really um, was what I was, what I was trying to find. And so I used her mainly for um, the color of her skin. And again, it's not when you're working, when you're dealing with the color of skin, there's, there's, there's so many colors that kind of come together to create the overall complexion. So all those subtleties, for me, it's very important to have somebody in front of you to be able to see that. I feel like I can't really get that from a photograph. Um, and she was a great model. Um, he didn't really, he wasn't a good model. Uh, and that, so that, that's just a corner of, of the studio. You can kind of see in the back too. I, this is a, this is actually a, an academic painting from the 19th century um, that I, that I have in, in the collection. I, I use ant, actual antique paintings to reference and just sort of to learn and understand how they applied their paint and their brushstroke and all those. And, and that's things. something that we had talked to you about. The committee had talked to you about was that they really wanted a 19th century looking paint. That's right. Um, yeah. And so those, those are some of the elements you brought to try to try to get that 19th That's right. century look. Yeah, yeah, they were, it was very, the committee was very specific. They didn't necessarily want it to look like a contemporary version of him. They wanted it to look like a 19th century painting. And uh, this, is the, this is the last slide. This is basically the painting, once I put it in the frame, and that was the morning of the day that I brought it to the, I drove it to the, to the league for the unveiling. So yeah. that's the process for this. We had a wonderful uh, program a couple of weeks ago in, in the unveiling. Um, by the way, this is going to be, uh, <laughs> actually you're working on it tonight. I have uh, to varnish it tonight. Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. it'll be uh, permanently placed on the first floor within the next uh, two weeks, which will be it. I don't want to say permanent because there's nothing permanent, uh, very little permanent, but at least uh, for the next uh, foreseeable future. So let's talk about you as an artist and your kind of journey to becoming an artist. And sure. I, what was your first doodle? And is that what inspired? <laughs> how, did you, how did you decide you wanted to be an artist? And where were you? And, and what, did, what did your life look like at that time? Sure. Um, just like most children, I was uh, interested in art at a very, very young age. Um, you know, when I was very, very young, all I really have to go on are the stories that my mother would tell me about my interest in art and how that formed. How true those are, I have no idea. Um, according to my mother, there I went. I was in uh, kindergarten with uh, another child that apparently was some sort of artistic prodigy, and it. Um, and I was fascinated by it and wanted to be able to do what he did. And so uh, just re really got interested in drawing at, at, at that age. So it was very, very young when I started drawing. Um, the, uh, all through um, my schooling, through middle school, 
I always had a very close relationship with the art teachers and a, and a very uh, strong interest in art classes. The high school that I went to was a, it was an arts high school, it was a magnet school. Um, and so I had many extra hours of, of art um, compared to a regular high school. And then um, when, once I uh, graduated high school, I was looking for colleges to go to. I knew, I knew very early on that I was drawn to a sort of a more classical, more traditional type of art. I was very drawn to the human figure, to portraiture, figurative art in general. Um, and so I was looking for an art college to go to to really further develop my, my skills, my understanding of uh, drawing and painting. Um, I ended up going to, at the time, the Kansas City Art Institute. At that time, that was considered one of the top art schools in the country. Um, I went out there. Um, I believe Nelson Shanks, who's also another portrait artist that's in the League's collection, also went there. Um, and so I, in my, in my first year there, I understood right away that uh, they don't teach technique. They don't teach the skill of drawing and painting. They focus very heavily on uh, the conceptual side of, of art. Um, they were very much a contemporary art school. Um, and so a lot of the work, a lot of the projects that I was working on in class, I had um, a, a, one of my first classes there was, it was a life-size self-portrait painting class. And so I thought that's perfect. That's exactly what I'm, you know, that's right up my alley. Um, and so I get into the class. They gave all the students their corner of the room. I, I found this giant mirror. I set up the mirror. I noticed I was the only one who had a mirror and was thinking, how are we <laughs> gonna do a self-portrait? Um, and so I, I started to work on this self-portrait in the spirit of Velasquez, one of my sort of art heroes. Um, and the teacher would come in and I would explain to her, you know, this is uh, my, my homage to Velasquez and, you know, it's based on this painting. And, and she would look at it and she'd say, no, 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 no. You don't get it. You don't get it. You don't get it. <sighs> and, uh, and all of the critiques would go on like this. Um, I was failing out of the mo most of the classes. Um, and so after the first year, I decided that this was not, I wasn't going to continue there. So I decided I left Kansas City after the first year and then was looking for other art schools where I could study. I looked at all the top schools um, and began to discover that none of them teach traditional skills, um, not a single one. They were all focused on, on conceptual, uh, conceptual art. Um, and so I was a bit at a loss. I didn't know where to go. Um, and so I started seeking out specific artists that I knew of. Again, this is at a time when the internet wasn't so, such a thing. So it was difficult to really do the research and kind of find schools uh, that were not necessarily the, the common sort of big colleges and things. Um, there was a gallery in, in New York City that's still around called Forum Gallery. And they, they're known for representing a lot of representational artists. Um, and so I tried to reach out to some of the artists that they represented to see where did they study with or if they teach. Um, at this point, I, I was around 19, 20 years old. Um, I ended up finding one artist that was represented by that gallery who said that she was, she was an Australian artist living in Harlem in New York. And, and she said that she had studied in Italy at a school called the Florence Academy of Art. Um, and, and I didn't know how to, they didn't have a website or anything. It wasn't, you know, I just got a phone, some Italian phone number. So I called it. Do you speak Italian? <laughs> no, I didn't know yeah. anything about Italian. <laughs> so I called the number and somebody answers, you know, prego. Uh, like, uh, is this the Florence Academy of Art? Um, they said, yes, we're, you know, we're a school, we're a small school. Um, we teach uh, traditional drawing and painting. So um, I, got, I understood the whole application process. I applied and everything. And um, I was accepted, but they said that there was a one-year wait to get in. Um, so I said, sure, I'll wait. And then uh, at some point, a couple months later, they said, they called me up and they said, we've got a, a space available uh, if you want to come. But if you want to come, you got to be here in three weeks. Okay, no problem. So I just, uh, at that time, I was really just floating around painting on my own. Packed up a backpack and just got a one-way ticket to Florence. 
um, had no idea if this was a real legitimate school at all. Um, I just showed up and uh, I ended up living there for 10 years. Um, it was a great school. It was exactly what I was looking for. Um, I, as a second year student, I was invited to, to teach there. So I started teaching while I was still a student um, and then continued on there uh, teaching. And I, I was commenting on this. If you look at, at Jordan's uh, CV, it has you studied in, I don't know, what was the year, 2000 and 2003? Three. And then I think it's 2005, you have instructor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like maybe it was even the next year, actually, as it, it was like the very next. Yeah. So all of a sudden you're, you're an instructor, right? Yes. You're, yeah. you're teaching. Yeah. You wind up in Spain. Yeah, eventually. <laughs> With a Spanish wife. And a Spanish yeah. wife. Yeah. We'll, get, we'll get back to her in a minute. We'll have back to her. Yeah. So they like you so much, they send you back to the States to, to open a school that's right. in the United States. Yeah. So, uh, yes, that's right. After, um, after 10 years in Florence and uh, teaching at the school, uh, I ended up moving to Spain for a year. And um, I decided to take a break from teaching at, at the Florence Academy and kind of open my own studio and, and teach on my own. And I was doing that for about a year. Um, but then at the same time, the Florence Academy had decided they wanted to open a branch in the United States. Um, and so they reached out to my wife and I, my wife's also an artist, um, and they asked us if we were interested in moving back to the United States to launch their United States branch. Um, and so after some thought, we, we decided to, to do it. We thought it might be an interesting experience. Um, and they, they wanted to open it in Jersey City. They wanted it to be in the New York City metropolitan area. So in 2014, we moved back to the United States and we opened the, the branch of the, of the Florence Academy. Um, yeah. So let's talk more about your art and, and kind of how you approach art and about maybe especially portraiture, right? So we, people say this to me sometimes when we're giving tours. I know this happens to Jim Mundy a lot. They'll say, wow, it really looks like what it looks like, you know, and that, right. you know, <laughs> or, or it looks like a Hopefully. photograph, yeah. right? And um, talk about that, right? Because <laughs> we're, not, we're, not, we're not going for a photograph. We can sure. get a photograph, sure. right? We're looking for something more. Sure. What is that more that you're trying to bring, which I think you do bring, but what yeah. is it? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. Um, I think it's one of the things, the, I think the answer to that is one of the things that really draw, draws me to uh, figurative art in general. Um, I think the, the figurative art is, I, I feel, uh, some of the issues that, that come up with figurative art a lot of the times is people read it, um, they sort of take a book by its cover. They, they, they think, oh, well, that's a painting of this. So that's what that painting is about. And I found that as, as a painter, the spending so much time observing paintings from the past and observing nature and trying to translate nature into a painting, there's, there's a lot of, abstraction that actually exists even within representational art. There's a language in the way that paint is used that can communicate something more than just what it represents. Um, and that's primarily because it's a person that is interpreting that information. So the way that I paint something is going to be different from the way that you paint something because <laughs> even, <true>. though, <laughs> <laughs> even though because we, we're seeing the same colors, um, we're seeing the same object, let's say, we might interpret some of those things differently based on our own experiences and our own um, sort of e emotional relationship to whatever it is that we're painting. And those things consciously and subconsciously come, come through into the painting. And so there, there is this sort of abstract language in the way that painting is used that can communicate something more than just the image that it represents. Um, and so that as a painter that obviously fascinates me um, and when it comes to painting portraits um, whether it's commissioned portrait or not whether it's somebody like Frederick Douglass what's so important for me as an artist is to, is to try to try to communicate something beyond just the representation of that person the image of that person um, and so it, working from a photograph trying to that's why it's so important to have that live model for me to be able to extract some of that vitality in that life that I can see from the model and sort of inject it into this photographic reference that I'm using so that the, ultimately the subject feels like they have life, that they are, that they are this human person. And, 
again, for, for me doing a commission, that's, I feel like that's the, that's what I'm striving for is to get, to represent the humanity of the person. Um, and so it's, it, he's this great icon, but he's also a human being. And I, I want that sort of emotional impact and that psychological impact within the painting. At least that's what I'm striving for. Do, do you think that uh, art portraiture in particular has changed since photography? Dramatically. How? If you look through, if you look at the history of painting, especially portrait painting and, and representational painting, you'll notice with the advent of photography, um, painting suddenly became far more realistic in a way. Um, prior to photography, there was more sort of stylization or mannerisms that were in the painting because there were other things that the painters were looking for beyond just the this sort of uh, kind of photographic perfection. Um, there were other things they were interested in kind of communicating. Uh, but then with the advent of photography, it gave artists uh, much more obviously sort of a solid reference to be able to use. And, and, and so their work started to become just sort of more realistic um, through the sort of turn of the century into the kind of mid 20th century. Um, you start to see more uh, sort of image based work. Um, and, th and that brings a whole other conversation about sort of uh, image versus painting, which is kind of what we, what we were just talking about sort of touches on that. Um, but then there was obviously, as you get into around the 1950s, 1960s, you start to see a big shift in just the art world in general, um, which is not necessarily because of the advent of photography, but many other things, cultural shifts and things like that. So how do you know when the painting is finished? Yeah, <laughs> you, you don't. There was a quote, Da Vinci, uh, there was a quote of Da Vinci's that said, a painting is never finished, it's only abandoned. Uh, and that's, uh, it's good to have deadlines. Well, yeah, we, right, reason. we had a, yeah. yeah. It, when, when, when would you put the last brush on that? When did I? Yeah. Oh, the, the, probably the morning that I brought it here. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could work it to death, yeah. So a lot of your paintings that we looked at were unfinished, right? There were parts sure. that were more finished than others. Sure, sure, sure. Right? Yeah. And is that true of this painting, you think? I mean, if I, if I, if there wasn't a deadline, I'd still be working on it. Right, but a lot of times you, you take, as you get to the head, things kind of get, or away from oh, it, they get I less. Have, right. Finished. Would you have done, or did you do that on purpose and not, because I, sure. I know that there are, like the book, yeah. right? Yeah. The book is not as finished as it's painted. That's right, yeah. Is that on purpose? It, it is, yeah. I do, I find that in a painting, the, how things are resolved within a painting, it creates a, a sort of narrative within itself. And so, you know, there's, there's a hierarchy of information within a painting. There are certain things that I want the viewer to look at and other things that I don't feel are as necessary to, for the viewer to look at. So I'll sort of play them down so they don't compete with the things that I do want you to look at. So let's, let's shift a little bit and talk about what you're doing now. Sure. Um, so you, you, when we, uh, when we contacted you, you were in process of moving from the Florence Academy in, right. in, in Jersey city to Lyme Academy. That's right. So yes. Tell us about Lyme Academy yeah. and your role there and tell us a little bit more about your wife. Yeah. Uh, it'd be my pleasure to do that. Um, so I, after running the Florence Academy for five years, um, we, my wife and I decided it took a lot of work to get the school up and running. And at, after five years, we had quite, quite a bit of students and, um, and we felt like uh, that those five years took us further away from our own studio practice than we would have liked. So we decided to take a break from uh, teaching and focus more on our own work. Um, that time it coincided almost exactly with COVID and um, which we worked out okay because then that gave us a year of really just being locked in our studios. Um, and there, so during that year, we spent that time um, with, uh, we spent, thank you. We spent that time <laughs> with, uh, with our son in, in our apartment and we set up a sort of makeshift studio um, in our apartment and, um, and we were quite productive. And then at some point we, um, we got a phone call 
from, uh, we got two phone calls basically during that year. One was from Jim Mundy and the other was from the Lyme Academy of Fine Arts in uh, Old Lyme, Connecticut. So the Lyme Academy is an interesting story. The Lyme Academy, as I said, is in Old Lyme, Connecticut. Old Lyme has a very great history as an art colony. Um, in 1899, an artist, an American artist who had studied in Paris, moved uh, back to the United States and he was traveling around through the United States trying to find light that resembled Barbizon school light that reminded him of the light that he saw in Barbizon, France. He was a landscape painter. When he got to Old Lyme, he felt like he had finally found a place that had that light. And so he stayed there painting um, and he met a woman there named Florence Griswold who ended up becoming a patron. And she had a beautiful house uh, right on the main street in Old Lyme. And she would let uh, this artist stay there. And he invited his friend, his artist friends. He said, I found this great place. This is incredible light. You should come and hang out. Let's all paint together. All his friends came. And they descended on Old Lyme. And this woman, Florence Griswold, she let them all stay in her house. Um, and for years, uh, artists would go there, mainly during the summers, and spend their time painting there. Um, schools like the Art Students League of New York started running summer landscape classes um, in Old Lyme. And many of those artists uh, ultimately bought houses there and lived there when they retired. Uh, and so it had a great history. And the Lyme Academy opened in 1976 by a female sculptor uh, named Elizabeth Gordon Chandler. And she had the same predicament um, that I had when I was trying to find art instruction. Uh, she felt like there were no schools teaching traditional skills. And so she opened the Lyme Academy specifically as a school that would teach traditional figurative drawing and painting. Um, and the school, she did well, the school did well. And um, as the school grew and grew, uh, at some point they thought we should become, let's become accredited, that it might legitimize the school in some way. And they eventually became connected with the University of New Haven. Um, and as that happened, the school over the years started to drift away from its original mission. And as it became more uh, university arts program, it became sort of similar to most other uh, most other art schools in their, in their art program. And, and so it, it, it actually didn't do that well. Um, and about, I would say, uh, three years ago, they, uh, the University of New Haven decided to sever their ties with the Lyme Academy. And the Lyme Academy was this beautiful campus and it just sat dormant for years. Um, the board of trustees at the time didn't know what to do with it. Uh, they were thinking of selling off the property just to develop it into condos. Um, and a new board came and the new board of trustees, they saw the, the, the potential. It's a, it is a beautiful campus with beautiful North Lit studios that were designed and built to be painting studios. Uh, and they were looking for a new artistic director that could create essentially a new program and get the school up and running um, in the spirit of its original mission, what it was meant to be. Um, and so they called my wife and I and asked us if we'd be interested in, in uh, running that program. And we said, definitely not. And we, <laughs> we're, uh, we're actually really happy right now working in our studios. Um, we, are, we don't wanna do that anymore. Um, and they said, well, have you been up here? Have you seen the, the place? And um, I, I had been in the area before, but I'd never seen the school and my wife had never been. So we thought, okay, well, let's go check it out. They were, it was like, you should definitely at least just come, come for a visit to see the space, let's have a chat. So we thought, all right, what else are we gonna do? It's COVID. Um, we, got, we, we got in our car, we drove up um, two hours out of the city, outside the city, and uh, we met with their uh, president of their board and a couple other board members. Um, we saw the space and, um, and it, was a, it is a, just a gorgeous area. It was a, it's really inspiring studio space and inspiring history. Um, and so after much thought, we decided to, uh, to, to take the position. Um, and it's been open now for how long? Three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. thanks. <laughs> and, and you and your wife yeah. run the art, your artistic directors? So we're we're co-artistic directors. I, uh, so I, I, when I went back in 2007, 
when I was still living in Florence, um, there was, uh, there's an American artist named J Jacob Collins who has a school in New York uh, called the Grand Central Atelier. Um, he started a program, a sort of foundation in the summer, it's called the Hudson River Fellowship. And it's basically every summer, uh, a large group of painters get together and they stay out in the Hudson River uh, Valley and they paint landscape paintings in the spirit of the Hudson River landscape painters. So the very first year that he decided to launch that was in 2007. And um, I had some friends that were joining that and they said, you, you know, I used to come back to the States in the summers. And they said, oh, you should just come and hang out with us there. I thought, okay. Um, so I went up to Hunter, New York and for about three weeks. And um, that's where I met uh, my, my wife. Um, she's, so she's from Spain. She's from the North of Spain, from Pamplona. Um, her name is Amaya Gurpide. And she was very lucky in growing up in Spain. She found an artist that happened to live in her small town who had studied at the Art Students League of New York and was teaching in, in Pamplona. So she studied with him and he urged her to move to New York to study figurative drawing and painting. And so as I was flying to Italy, she was coming to New York and she studied in New York for, for 10 years. Um, and so we, uh, we met in 2007 and she eventually moved uh, to Madrid, moved back to Spain. And then when I left Florence, I moved, I met her in Madrid and, that, and we got married that year when I moved to Madrid. We had a seven year long distance relationship. And then, um, and then we, yeah, we got married yeah, in Madrid. So, yeah. so, <laughs> so let, let's, uh, let's see if we have a few questions. Um, Hold on, hold on, John. <laughs> we, we're on, we're streaming live. So this is how we're going to do um, uh, questions. We're going to give you a mic. You're going to ask a question and it's going to be three sentences max, John. That's all you get. Okay. <laughs> so do we have a, do we have a, a microphone for John over here? You do. Yes, there has to be a question three mark sentences, at the end. Right? Three sentences. I got one sentence. <laughs> one so in your relationship, who's the boss? You or her? <laughs> Our son. <laughs> good detour, good detour. Is she an introvert or an extrovert? Our son? You or Me. her. You or her. Me. Oh, I'm more of an introvert. She's more of an extrovert. Correct. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, Mitch? It was Mitch? a great presentation, a great you know, what you found education-wise and everything else, but out of curiosity, do you and your wife critique each other's work? And the other thing is, if Frederick Douglass was alive today and looked at your work, what do you think he might say about oh. it? <laughs> Great. Day. Thanks for that question. Um, first, yes, my wife, my wife and I, we, we definitely critique each other's work. I, um, I find that it's, it's, as an artist, it's very important to get feedback from people, other artists that, uh, or not necessarily only artists, but people that I trust, I trust what they think. Um, and my wife is definitely one of those. Uh, and currently we share a studio space. It's a large space and I have half the space and she has the other half. And we are regularly uh, looking at what each other is doing and giving each other feedback. And um, yeah, Frederick Douglass was, uh, was alive. I, I don't know, I, I really don't know. I mean, I would hope that he would at least um, feel that I portrayed him with the dignity that I was, uh, that I was really hope, hoping to, to, to sort of instill within the painting. Um, that would be my hope, yeah. Yes. Um, I have a statement, I think you would love it. Oh, I've thanks. seen many, many portraits of him and thanks. I think it's one of the best ones I've seen. Thank you. Second, my question is, in the school that you and your wife are now responsible for, are you teaching the classical style of portraiture and art, or is it more of the creative genre where you paint what you feel and how you feel, as opposed to the classical dynamics? Sure. We, we, uh, that's a good question. We, we very much focus on uh, the foundations of drawing and painting. It's very skill-based. Um, we, our philosophy is that if, if, a student has the skills, the skill set, then with that skill set, they can produce whatever it is they want to produce. 
but that they should never feel inhibited by a lack of ability. And so our focus is more on the technique side, really understanding how to translate the visual experience and interpret that onto canvas. Um, yeah. Have you ever done any abstract work? I have, when I was at the Kansas City Heart Institute. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Gary, we have a question over here. Uh, so first, thank you for the painting. Uh, second, you. the book and his left elbow. Uh, <laughs> what do you imagine that it was and do such details matter? Um, I think it's an interesting question. I don't know exactly what it was. It could have been a Bible, um, but I'm not sure what it was. I think it, I think what's, I think it's nice that it's sort of left up to interpretation to sort of imagine what you think it could have been. Um, in my, in my mind, while I was painting it, I was imagining that it may have been a Bible. And that's something we talked about in the, uh, in the committee and we imagined it could be all kinds of things. Sure. Yeah. 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 Joe question over here. Yes. Yeah, hi, George. Mm. And there's a huge variety in colorization of Black Americans. Yes. How did you come up with that color for Frederick Douglass? Yeah. It's, it's excellent, mind you, but Thank you. how did you uh, decide that that's his complexion versus, sure. say, my complexion, sure. or my wife's complexion? Or sure. Yeah, I appreciate that question because it, it is that is something that I thought quite a bit about, um, particularly when trying to. Uh, choose a model. Um, and I, I I there is the understanding that he um, uh, presumably um, was mixed race. Um, and so that that initially gave me some direction as to as to his complexion. And then also, even though the, the photographs are black and white, just in terms of understanding value wise, sort of where, what I believe the complexion may have been. And then, um, and then sort of looking at a lot of different potential models and then finding this one model that I felt like her complexion just sort of nailed for me what, what I was envisioning um, and kind of what I, what I thought most likely his complexion would have looked like. The model had a, was also mixed race. She had a very similar sort of um, uh, background. Uh, that Douglas did, and and her complexion was just like had a beautiful glow to it as well. So I, I thought it would be just the perfect, the, she would be the perfect model for the for the skin tone. And, and Jordan, I don't know that we've talked to you about this, but your Alan Turing painting, which is a painting from a photograph, obviously. Yeah. Yes. You know, yes. Um, yeah. We spent a lot of time looking at that as a committee, and I think the committee was believe that kind of came alive in the same way, you know, we knew that you had models, we knew that you knew what you're sure. doing from, from, a, from a photograph and, and could pull it off. So uh. the Turing one was really, I think we spent a lot of time looking at that, uh, understanding how you must have done it, you know. Yeah. Joe. And I'm gonna ask everyone to please, I know we can all hear in the room, but they can't hear you on Zoom unless you're right in the mic. So please use the mic. Hey, in the same vein of like colorization, have you ever seen like a colorized photo of Frederick Douglass or considered or ever done colorization of a black and white photo? Yes, there, there are some colorized photos of Douglass. Um, even the, one of the photographs that I had put up there, the one that was a little bit more high resolution of his face, there's actually a colorized version of that. Um, and I, I was using that at some point, I thought I could use it, but with, the, with colorized photographs, they're, they tend to be uh, still sort of flat. Um, they don't necessarily get into all the nuance. And so I found that actually the black and white version of that photo gave me a little bit more of what I needed rather than the colorized version. I was hoping the colorized version was gonna like nail it for me, but yeah, it didn't. Mr. Johnson. First of all, outstanding. Thank you. Secondly, in your in your dreams going forward, mm. who would you depict next and who would you capture? <laughs> wow, um, that's a tough question. Um, that's, a, that's a very difficult question. And I- You don't, you don't do many historic or right. actually 
kind of what we might consider, uh, you know, famous subjects. That's right. Right. Yeah. I don't, I don't do a lot of commission. Um, I, I turn down a lot of commissions, um, mainly because I, I just prefer to work on my own, my own work. Um, and never thought that I would be in a position to be asked to paint somebody like Alan Turing or Frederick Douglass. And it's a, obviously a great honor to be able to. Um, I, you know, I, it's, it's tough. It's, it's a tough thing because I, I, um, I feel that no, no matter who, I'm, who I paint, um, whether it's somebody as, uh, as well known as, as Frederick Douglass, as important as him, um, or it's, just uh, somebody, just an, you know, somebody that's in my neighborhood that is just posing for me. I, I feel like I try to instill sort of the, the same level of humanity regardless. Um, and I, I feel like I'm trying, I try to capture just that common universal sense of sort of humanness um, that we all share. And I, I find that that's, that's really my sort of goal and inspiration when I paint. Um, and my, so my hope is just to be able to, continue to, to do that. And hopefully the more I paint sort of get to, to the deeper truths of what it means just to be a human being in this world, um, regardless of who the person is. Well, we have time for one last question. Yes. Hi. Um, yeah. Lovely painting. Thank you. I had to start with that. Um, Thanks. nice to see a fellow New Yorker in the building. <laughs> um, can, can you tell us about your time in Queens and how it affected your artistic journey? Sure, I, I'm originally from Queens. Um. As is Victoria. <laughs> Victoria is a, a Union League scholar and a Good Citizenship Award recipient uh, and a Gerard College graduate. Thank you. Um, I did, I, I was born in Queens. I left Queens when I was about five years old, moved to Long Island and was in Long Island until I was about 13. Um, and I, I would say that um, I still have a lot of, even though I left Queens when I was young, I still actually have quite a, a lot of memories of growing up in Queens. And, um, uh, and I, I feel a very strong connection in general to, to New York. Um, and I feel that, that my relationship with New York influences my art quite a bit um, and, and just sort of my artistic life in, as a whole and in general, um, having access to all the incredible museums that are there. And not, and not just, um, even though I, I am a painter within a sort of classical tradition, I am still quite a, uh, an admirer of contemporary art. And, and I do look at a lot of contemporary art um, just uh, as an influence in, in my own work um, in, for, for various reasons. But I, and so New York has always been, uh, obviously as a, as a sort of major center of, of the art world, uh, has always just been a, a major inspiration for me as, as an artist. So Jordan, tell us where we can view some of your art online. Online, I, my website, my Instagram, um, jordansokol.com is my website. And I have an Instagram page as well. Um, and tell, tell us where Lime, Lime Academy. Dot and uh, limeacademy.edu. Um, you can see the school's website as well. And um, I, I did ask uh, uh, Jordan earlier, uh, what does he have for sale? And the answer was nothing. <laughs> I don't have any inventory at the moment. Nothing, nothing, nothing. But you hope that changes. That will uh, change soon. Yeah, good, yeah. good, good. Uh, Jordan, thank you for being here. Thank you for thank this you. great addition. Jordan Sokol. Thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks. So, thanks. Well, they like you. Yeah. They like your painting. Yeah, they like your painting. Yeah, yeah. they like your painting. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much. We have several really wonderful upcoming events. Uh, Civil War Roundtable on October 27th. I'm surprised that Kira sent this to me. I thought it was sold out. That is not, <laughs> that, uh, I'm not kidding. We have a, a close to capacity crowd for Robert E. Lee, A Life with Alan Gelso. November 1st, we have a Royal Oak program. We're back uh, with Royal Oak on site on the Lamb House. And then November 11th, uh, a great library hour, Philadelphia Builds Essay on Architecture with Michael Lewis. So we'll see you on October 27th for Alan Galzo on his new biography on uh, Robert E. Lee. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Great. Let me turn myself oh, off. Yeah.